Let's see if we can remember what we talked about this afternoon. A little bit of review. What two things do we know about neutrality? That's right. They aren't neutral, and you shouldn't be neutral. The Lord Jesus didn't call you into his service so that you might be a secret agent of his kingdom. You know, it's like I'm serving the Lord Jesus, but I don't want anyone to know about that. I've got to put up this pretense of being neutral, open to everything. You're not open to everything. If you want to learn anything and have knowledge, you must have the fear of the Lord at the very outset of the learning process. <clears throat> this afternoon we saw that there is an antithesis between the worldview of the believer and the worldview, the many worldviews, whatever variety you have, of the unbeliever. God has established that antithesis when he put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That antithesis is seen throughout the Bible. It will be seen for all eternity in the separation of the saved and the damned. There is an antithesis, a different way of looking at reality and the way we know and how we should live our lives. However, unbelievers are not going to acknowledge that antithesis. If they were to acknowledge the antithesis, they would be saying of themselves that they are prejudiced that they have their pre-commitments, they have their presuppositions. But if that is the case, then they stand guilty before God. And so the unbelieving world will rather say that it is neutral on philosophical matters, and that everybody should have an open mind. We should be objective and look at the evidence and follow it wherever it will go. And that sounds great. It sounds noble. It sounds like the right thing to do. It's just that no one's able to do that. No one does do that. They are not neutral. They profess that neutrality in order to claim their innocence before God. For you see, if they really are neutral, open-minded people, then their lack of faith can't be their own fault. Their lack of faith has got to be God's fault. God's unclear. God hasn't given enough evidence. God hasn't shown himself in such a way that I've been convinced. And so religious faith comes down to being, according to them, a leap of faith, a surrendering of rationality. Because God did not provide clear evidence to reasonable men, many reasonable men they claim for themselves are not going to be able to follow the scripture and believe it and they will ridicule you for doing so. In Romans 1, Paul shows us that God has demonstrated himself openly to all mankind. Each and every individual is without excuse because the clear revelation of God has been made to them. Paul says they know God. In their heart of hearts, they know God. They couldn't think without knowing God. They couldn't get along in this world without knowing God. All of their experience would be meaningless without knowing God, and yet they suppress it in unrighteousness. Knowing God, they do not glorify Him as God, and for that reason, Paul says, they're led into vain and futile thinking. And that's the point we pick up on right now when we start, start talking about specifically how can you defend the Christian worldview over against the non-Christian worldview. And I'm going to put some things up on the board and talk about that, but before we do, just one more point underlying the impossibility of neutrality. When we talk about worldviews, we are talking about how we should see reality, how we know about reality, and how we should live. What are some of the worldviews that we've been exposed to? Anybody? I'm sorry? Atomism, okay. Monism. Pragmatism. Anybody got... Well, determinism is one of the subcategories, that's right. Dualism. Okay, so we have all these isms, right? Every one of them tells you something about the nature of reality. Every one of these worldviews tells you something about the nature of knowledge, how a man knows what he knows. And every one of these worldviews tells you how you should live your life and what attitudes you should have tells you about ethics. 
Now, some people have suggested that in order to choose between worldviews, what you should do is, first of all, establish your theory of knowledge. That is, get an epistemology. Remember that word? It's going to be on the quiz. Epistemology, theory of knowledge, the nature and limits of human knowledge. They say we should work out a theory of knowledge and then apply that theory, that method of knowing, to the facts of experience and then decide what reality is all about. So very simply, you've got something of a two-step procedure here. You get your epistemology without any metaphysical commitments or prejudices, and then you apply your epistemology to gain some kind of metaphysical conclusion. Is reality one? Is it made up of two kinds of things? Is it a bunch of atoms of matter? If you want to know the nature of reality, it seems to some people reasonable that you should first of all decide how we know what we know and then ask what do we know about the nature of reality. And you're going to be exposed to that so often and it's taken so, so much for granted even by many Christian apologists that I'd like to take just a moment and give you a little hokey illustration to show you why that cannot happen. One cannot choose a theory of knowledge without in some measure presupposing already something about the nature of reality. In fact, what I would argue is one first chooses a worldview where there is an epistemology and a metaphysical outlook that in some measure are coordinate with each other. It is not an accident in the history of philosophy that people who had a philosophy such as Plato's, an idealistic philosophy, also came up with an intuitionist or rationalist epistemology. Because they thought that the realm of ideas and ultimate truth was outside of time and space, it only made sense then that their theory of knowledge would rely upon intuition of those things that go beyond human experience. Or rational concepts which are clear and distinct and all men know innately, rather than knowing them from the observation of the world and their experience. And in the history of philosophy, it is no surprise that those who have denied that kind of thing and have said this world is all there is, have come up with what we call an empirical epistemology. A theory of knowledge that is based on observation and experience. Whatever we know, we know through our senses. Because this world around us, the world of time and space, the physical domain is all there is, there ain't no more. And so you mustn't have the naive idea, which even some of your professors will teach, that you can choose your epistemology with a kind of neutrality toward whether there's a God or what the nature of reality is. You choose your epistemology and everyone comes to agree on what the method of knowing will be and then we all take that method of knowing and we apply it to the world and we find out what reality is all about. So here's, some, here's a hokey little story to show you why that's impossible. Let's imagine that you have an apple orchard and you've got a lot of apples coming in and you want to sell these apples and in order to do so you're going to have to sort the good apples from the bad apples because if you just dump any number of apples indiscriminately and arbitrarily into a box try to sell them you're going to find that uh, the produce people who turn around and sell this to the public would be very unhappy with you. They don't want to buy a box that arbitrarily has bad apples in it. And so in order for you to make money selling your apples, you're going to have to sort the apples. And so you devise a machine that sorts the apples. And you dump all of your apples into this machine, and I don't even know what the internal guts of this thing would look like, but the apples go in this side, and then the machine does its work, and then the good apples come out over here into one bin and the bad apples into another bin. All right, you all got the picture? An apple sorting machine, great idea. We want to determine the good apples from the bad apples, and what we're going to do is devise a machine to do that for us. Now that machine, in the broadest sense, is a method of apple sorting. Right? That machine pursues some procedure or method whereby the good and the bad apples are separated. 
And now here's the $64,000 question. Are you all awake? Would it be possible to devise such a machine, that is, put together such a method, if you did not know in advance a good apple from a bad apple? What if I was new to this um, whole realm? Uh, let's say I had never been exposed to apples in my life. I hardly knew what an apple was. And I inherit this orchard. And then I'm going to build a machine that separates the good apples from the bad apples when I know nothing about apples. What's the likelihood of success? Oh, nearly zero, I suppose, if this universe has any kind of randomness to it, I might accidentally make a machine that does it. What I'm getting at is, if you don't know something about apples to begin with, you can't devise a method for separating them. And in the same way, if you don't know something about the universe to begin with, if you don't know something about reality to begin with, if you don't know something about the difference between truth and error about the universe to begin with, you can't devise a method that separates the true conclusions from the false conclusions about reality, can you? You can't even devise an epistemology, an apple sorting machine, unless you already know something about reality, you already know something about the apples to begin with. Everyone begins with a worldview. Everyone begins with a certain view of reality. And in terms of that reality, or that perception, that conception of reality, you devise your epistemology, your theory of knowledge. And so neutrality is indeed impossible. What I've been arguing against here is called philosophical Methodism. It has nothing to do with the Methodist Church. Philosophical Methodism is the view that method takes precedence over every other consideration in philosophy. One first gains a method of knowing and then you argue about ethics, then you argue about metaphysics. And the apple sorting machine story was simply to illustrate the impossibility of philosophical Methodism. Nobody has a theory of knowledge that is neutral. All right, so we've gotten the point across that no one is neutral. We've gotten the point across that people have worldviews that control their thinking. And now the question that was asked last night, and I said you have to sleep on it, well, what are we going to do then when two worldviews come up against one another? How are we going to argue with the unbeliever? You need to realize that every system of thought has a starting point which verifies itself. And that's not the sort of thing you're going to hear at the university. People don't like to admit that. But it's inescapable. Every system of thought has what we call a self-attesting authority for itself. For you see, every system of thought, when it develops its apple-sorting machine, is going to have to verify and verify and verify the claims that are made, but eventually he's going to stop verifying and saying, that's just it, that's the obvious. Because no argument runs on and on and on and on. Every system of thought gets to the place where they say, that's the most basic standard for knowing. And then if you ask the question, well, how do you know that that's the right standard? A person is either going to have to offer that standard as the verification of the standard, or is going to look at something else outside of that standard to verify the standard. Now, if you look at something outside of that standard, is the standard the ultimate one? Obviously not, because what you look at at that point becomes more ultimate than what you called your ultimate standard. So now we've got to start the question all over again. Now, that thing that you appeal to, is it an ultimate standard? If it's an ultimate standard, it is going to have to authorize itself or appeal to something outside of itself. If it appeals to something outside of itself, is it the ultimate standard? No, I mean, this is getting boring, Dr. Bonson. Move on. You all get the point, don't you? In the nature of the case, an ultimate standard must authorize itself. And that's why unbelieving systems of thought have to be pressed to see that they have got an ultimate authority for their thinking, just like you have an ultimate authority for your thinking. 
And when it gets around to verifying that ultimate authority over against the other person's ultimate authority, I will end up eventually assuming my ultimate authority. But so will the unbeliever. The unbeliever will assume his or her ultimate authority in the process of reasoning, and I will assume my ultimate authority in the process of reasoning, even when we're talking about what the ultimate authority should be. And you're going, Dr. Bonson, how are we going to get through this then? It seems like they're going to be, you know, sealed off from any witness, any effective defense, just like we are. It's going to be, we're in, in different towers yelling at each other, but never able to get together, never have any meaningful intellectual contact. There is no neutrality. Worldviews tend to be self-attesting. That is, they, they assume an ultimate authority which authorizes itself. So how do we reason with these people? The question that we're going to be asking in one form or another is which worldview makes human experience intelligible? Which worldview makes human experience intelligible? Which worldview comports with those things that the Christian and the non-Christian both say or do? Earlier today I told you that though there is an antithesis in principle, unbelievers cannot work in God's world according to their own um, philosophy. They are going to be inconsistent. They are going to say things and do things that uh, do not comport with what they profess about the nature of reality and how we know and how we should live our lives. And so one of the things you're going to be asking is, how is it that what we both want to say about, say, torturing children being wrong, how is it that these things that we hold in common can be true. Which worldview makes sense out of that? Which worldview makes human experience intelligible? Now, in asking which worldview, you know, I'm asking what network of presuppositions about reality, knowledge, and ethics makes human experience intelligible? What do we mean by human experience? anything. Human experience involves anything whatsoever. You can take the unbeliever and talk to him or her about any subject whatsoever. And you can talk to your milkman or you can talk to the philosophy professor about anything they want to talk about and the same problems are going to arise. By human experience, we simply mean all those things that we believe and do, all those things that we say, all of our conduct, all of our attitudes. And so that you can take your roommate in college and deal with anything that's part of his or her experience and challenge them to make it intelligible. Now, what do we mean by make it intelligible? Which philosophy of reality, knowledge, and ethics can take those things which we believe and do in human experience and make them intelligible. And by that we mean make sense of them or see them as meaningful. Perhaps the easiest way to illustrate this would be to talk about an ethical belief. If you have a roommate or a professor who says that a certain kind of activity, maybe oppressing the poor, is immoral, what you're going to be asking is, well now, professor, what outlook on reality, knowledge, and ethics will make what you've just said about oppressing the poor meaningful? Let's assume that we are in the worldview of evolution, materialistic atheistic evolution. What is man? 
That's one of the questions having to do with reality, the nature of reality. What is man? Well, the answer here is man is, well, one of the advanced animals, really. He is just a primordial slime that is developed by chance over eons and eons and is now somehow miraculously, except that we can't have miracles in an atheistic world, do you? Oh, no. Miraculously, somehow, we're still trying to figure it out, has become this complicated creature that we see. Okay? Now, if your professor says that that is man, man is in this universe all alone, in a cold, impersonal universe, and that somehow, miraculously, the primordial slime developed into, oh, how's it go? Through the fish and all this kind of stuff. And then finally comes out looking like this, wearing a suit and tie, <laughs> saying, it's wrong to oppress the poor. You say, but professor, it makes no sense to claim that it's wrong to oppress the poor. Because if evolution is true, then it is, in fact, a dog-eat-dog -dog world, isn't it? I mean, by your own assumptions. You would say the way we got here is because we learned to adapt. We survived, got rid of those, you know, weaker species. And in the process, learned to take advantage of those animals that didn't have the intelligence and the tool-making ability that we did. And so it is part of our history, it is part of our very nature to oppress others for our own benefit. Given your evolutionary worldview, it doesn't make any sense. It is not meaningful to condemn someone. So now, this is just a very simple, slowly um, explained procedure in apologetics. We're always going to be asking people, we'll take anything they want to talk about. It doesn't make any difference. And that's why when Gary told you before I began the lecture that this method of apologetics does not require you to read up on every point of view and every problem that's ever been raised because once you learn how to think as a Christian, you can deal with anything that comes to you. That isn't to say it won't help for you to learn more about those philosophies and some of those problems that are there. It's just to say you don't have to worry about it if you haven't done all of your homework. Because you're always going to ask, well now which view of reality, knowledge, and ethics can make whatever we're talking about or experiencing meaningful. What can make sense out of it? What makes it intelligible? You go to a concert with your friend, the concert come, is a wonderful performance, and you walk out and your friend tells you that that was really beautiful, that was really stirring. Well, what view of life makes intelligible the very notion of beauty. In fact, what view of life makes intelligible the whole notion of self-awareness? I mean, theoretically, human beings in an atheist universe are nothing but advanced bricks. Now, I know your professors won't tell you that because they want to hide the fact that they've got a really stupid theory of reality. And by stupid, I mean it's something that's dull, it's dense. Professor, was the primordial slime aware of itself? No. Well, when it became a fish, was it aware of itself? <laughs> At what point did self-aware... I mean, you're dealing with what? Protons and neutrons and electrons, right? Actually, subatomic particles. We're dealing with blips of energy when all is said and done. This is the classics illustrated approach to physics. Okay? These blips of energy are there. And now, is one little blip of energy aware of itself? I think it lies around wondering, why would anybody tamper with a smoke alarm? No, it doesn't have thoughts like that. It isn't like you. It's just a little blip of energy. Now, what happens when you get one blip of energy together with a whole bunch of other blips of energy, each and every one of them too stupid to think about anything. They're dull. They're insensitive. They're just blips of energy. And you get enough of these blips of energy, you might even get a molecule of oxygen. Boom! There it is. And now you get another molecule of hydrogen and so forth, and eventually you got a drop of water. Now, 
if you move from zero self-consciousness and multiply that a thousand times and then multiply that a million times till you finally get a drop of water, do you got self-consciousness? No. That was a, not a trick question. You should have been able to answer that. Now, what if we get a lot of drops of water together? You got zero again, self-consciousness. You get all these drops of water together, is the primordial slime going to be self-aware? Class? No, that's, that's right. Okay, and if you get a lot of primordial slime and things happen to it, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know where lightning bolts come from on this worldview, but a lightning bolt hits it, and it gets energized, and so now it's energetic primordial slime. In fact, it says it's got to start growing and doing things and adapting to an environment which, come to think of it, is nothing but primordial slime. So what's it adapting to? Well, that's, that's, we're working on that one. Multiply that a thousand times. You got self-awareness yet? No. You see, whenever the unbeliever talks about anything at all, he or she is assuming self-awareness, assuming a notion of beauty, of moral propriety, of rationality, of the uniformity of the world round about, the predictability of human experience. There are any number of things that are simply taken for granted. And what you're going to do as a Christian apologist is you're going to ask, what worldview makes sense out of that? Is self-awareness a big problem within the Christian worldview? No, the Bible tells us that God created man in his own image. God is aware of himself. In fact, before he created the world, that's all he was aware of, right? Himself. And he made man as his image, to think as he thinks, to make moral evaluations and evaluations of beauty as he himself does. And so self-awareness is no problem in the Christian worldview. That isn't to say, I can tell you how God did it. It's not that kind of how question. It's not a mechanical question like, well, how do you make the Empire State Building? I'm not asking that. I'm saying, how can it be? How can there be anything like self-awareness in this worldview over here? In our worldview, it makes perfectly good sense, even if we don't know how God does it. And so the key apologetical question, once again then, is which worldview makes sense out of human experience? And human experience is so broad that that can include anything at all that you want to talk about. The method of apologetics that I am suggesting to you can be found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. And before we look at that, just a word of explanation, you need to realize that the Bible speaks of those who do not submit themselves to the fear of the Lord and God's revelation as fools. Now, when the Bible does this, it's not engaging in cheap name-calling. This is not Mr. T going, you fool. <laughs> no. It's an attempt to describe a mindset it's an attempt to describe what's wrong with the thinking of some person and why they aren't getting along well in this world, either conceptually or socially or whatever it may be. The fool refuses to have God in his knowledge. What does the Bible tell us? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Doesn't take account of God. Tries to live without God. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the Proverbs tell us. The fool is the one who will not submit to God's Word. And now in Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, we are told how we should answer fools. And there are fools galore in the university. Indeed, I sometimes think the song about the ship of fools is about the modern university. Full of foolish, stupid people that have PhDs. They have all of this mental ability wasted because they don't understand life and truth at all. Now, when these fools attack your faith, Proverbs 26 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. This fool has got a worldview 
that is full of problems and contradictions and cannot comport with all sorts of things that the fool says and does. This worldview is full of internal tensions, cannot make sense out of human experience. And so don't answer the fool with his own folly. Don't give the foolish philosophy, don't use the foolish philosophy of the unbeliever as the basis for your answering him. Because if you do, the verse says, you will be like unto him. You buy into his worldview and you'll end up just as foolish as he is. Don't answer the fool according to his folly, lest you also be like unto him. So when the unbeliever says, now you've got to give up your religious assumptions, and you've got to reason just like I do, and then we'll decide whether there's the God, you say, no thanks. Just say no to that kind of thinking. <laughs> because the minute you start taking that drug, you're not going to be able to escape either apart from the grace of God and your inconsistency. But, if you use his philosophy, where's his philosophy going to take him if his worldview is self-attesting? If he's always assuming his most ultimate authority when he engages in philosophy, where do you think his philosophy is going to end up? Right back where it starts. He's going to use his methods of reasoning, he's going to use his apple sorting machine, to come to conclusions about apples that he started out with, to begin with. So don't answer the fool according to his folly, because if you do, you'll end up in his worldview as well. What's the next verse say? Answer a fool according to his folly. <laughs> now we get another step. Just the opposite of what the Bible just said. The Bible said in the first place, you've got to give an answer that does not show the fool that you're going to be sucked into the problems of his worldview. But then on the other hand, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, for argument's sake, okay, let me, let me go with you here. Let's run with this a bit. Let's take your foolish, of course, you don't want to call it a foolish philosophy if you want him to have another cup of coffee and keep talking. So let's take your philosophy, and you're saying foolish philosophy. Let's take your philosophy, and let's see what happens if we think of the world this way. If we think of knowledge this way, if we think of ethics this way, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Lest he think he's got wisdom, lest he think conceitedly that he is able to find out anything about reality given his philosophy, show him where his philosophy takes him. And so you have two things you want to do. And this is not a four spiritual laws approach to apologetics. I don't mean it has to be step one, step two. You may do a little bit of step one and a little bit of step two, and then do a little bit more step one, a little bit of step two. You may start with step two instead of step one. I'm not trying to give you a prepackaged, factory produced approach to apologetics. But you do know that these are the things you want to accomplish in one way or another in your conversation. The conversation may go over a number of days, a number of months, maybe even years. It may take place all in ten minutes while you're sitting in an airport. I don't know what the circumstance will be. But this is what you should be trying to achieve in all of your apologetical encounters. You want to show that your worldview makes sense of human experience. And the unbelievers does not. And so I'm sitting in the airport and I strike up a conversation with somebody and I find out that this person is really upset about child abuse. And I also find out that this person thinks that religion is a bunch of malarkey and it's a bunch of superstition. Now, what do I want to do when I'm talking to this person? As much as I can, in the providence of God, as time allows and opportunity is there, what I want to do is say, you know, I don't believe in child abuse either. I think it's horrible. And I can make sense of that, given my view of reality, given my view of God and man and man's place in the universe and what God has called us to do, given my outlook on life, what we're saying about child abuse being wrong makes a whole lot of sense. But you know what? On your worldview, I don't see why that makes sense at all. Given your anti-religious worldview, your materialistic, atheistic worldview, why shouldn't some people take advantage of other people? The fact that they're bigger and others are smaller, 
really doesn't mean anything in an atheistic worldview. See, what I have done is I have, on the one hand, not answered the fool according to his folly, lest I end up not having anything to say at the end and being just as foolish. But on the other hand, saying, well, now let, let's think about this. Where would your worldview take you? Given your worldview, you couldn't even make sense of what we were talking about, namely child abuse being immoral. And so there you have the two major steps in every apologetical encounter. You want to show that there are worldviews in collision, different philosophies of life. And within one philosophy of life, things make sense, like rationality and science and ethics and human dignity. And within the other worldview, they do not. What we are doing here is challenging the unbeliever to provide what are called the preconditions of intelligibility. That sounds very fancy, very philosophical and sophisticated, but it's just what you see up on the board. We are challenging the unbeliever to provide the preconditions, the worldview, that will make anything in human experience intelligible. And our argument is simply this. If you don't follow the Christian worldview, you can't make sense out of anything. That is to say, every contrary point of view is impossible, philosophically speaking. Every point of view contrary to Christianity <clears throat> is impossible because it doesn't make sense out of human experience or belief. It cannot make intelligible anything in human experience. We see this kind of apologetical challenge in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20, which is something I think of uh, the theme of Christian apologetics. Paul says, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? When we deal with unbelievers, we may not want to say, you know, you're a fool and that's your problem. Just engage in what will be taken as name-calling. But we want to demonstrate the foolishness of their philosophy. And our challenge is, where is the debater of this age? The disputer of this age? Where is the philosopher who, following non-Christian standards, can make sense out of anything? Can make sense out of rationality? Can make sense out of morality? Can make sense out of self-awareness? can make sense out of science, can make sense out of human dignity. Where is the philosophy that does this? It doesn't exist. For God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that with all your heart? And if you do, you will effectively be able to counter whatever challenge is brought to your faith by the university professor, roommate, or anybody else. Now, I need to give you a little insight here. Your ability to drive home this argument does not depend upon the unbeliever giving in and saying, oh, you must be right. Don't confuse apologetical success with subjective persuasion of your opponent. I'll say something that may sound surprising at first to you, but it's true. God doesn't call you to change people's hearts. And you know why God doesn't do that? Because you can't do it. People who are sold into sin and rebellion and who are spiritually dead, you can't do a thing about that. Only God can. Only the work of the Holy Spirit is going to make an effective witness persuasive. But having said that, don't think that the work of the Holy Spirit takes place in thin air. What the Spirit empowers is our witness, not silence. And if I'm going to witness for the truth of God, I want to witness in the most effective way possible, the way which is most true, most consistent, most God-glorifying. And that's why we have a conference like this where I teach you to think as Christians. The fact that the work of the Spirit is necessary to persuade people doesn't mean we shouldn't do good work. 
because we are working for one who requires of us our best efforts, those which glorify him and testify to him consistently and faithfully. And so your work is not to change people's hearts. In a sense, your work is simply to close their mouths. You can take their antagonism and their hostility and what they say against Christianity and show that even that couldn't make sense unless Christianity were true in the first place. That the worldview of Christianity is necessary to make sense even of the arguments of those who oppose it. And that's what I'm getting at when I talk about the impossibility of the contrary. Our challenge is that there is no disputer or debater of this age who can take a contrary point of view and show that it makes sense out of human experience. Now I'm going to give you a sentence that I want to read a couple times over because it's crucial. And the more you meditate on this and think about it, hopefully the more you'll get the point of what you want to do, whether it's a 10-minute encounter with a Hare Krishna at the airport or a 10-year writing you know, campaign with your roommate from college. The proof of the Christian worldview, the proof of the Christian worldview is that without it, you couldn't prove anything. The proof of the Christian worldview is that without it, you couldn't prove anything. Whether you were talking about the beauty of a concert, the laws of physics, the meaning of history, or the immorality of child abuse. No matter what it is, you couldn't prove anything if you didn't have the Christian worldview to begin with. And that is the best proof of Christianity, is that without it, you can't prove anything. Without God, you can't do anything, ultimately. Unless, of course, you live on borrowed capital. Unless you start cheating. Unless you start living in a way that's inconsistent with your own worldview. This leads me to my last point before I open the floor for questions from you. The last thing you need to know about apologetics is the unbeliever is not a system of thought. The unbeliever is a person. And for that reason, when you talk to this person, you will find that he or she is not going to be true to their system of thought. They are not going to live up to what they say about reality, knowledge, and ethics. And when you present the challenge of the Apostle Paul, where is the debater of this age? And you try to show the impossibility of the contrary, that is, that any worldview other than Christianity makes human experience impossible, makes it meaningless. One of the things you're going to hear people say is, oh, no, no that's not, I can make sense out of my, I'm scientific, I'm rational, I'm a good person. And to that you want to say, yes, you are. Because you live in God's universe and you know God in your heart of hearts. And so you don't live up to your philosophy. What you want to be aware of and what you want to get across to the unbeliever is that he or she has deceived themselves about reality and how we know and how we should live. They are not computers, these people. They are not systems of thought. And because they are people, they are able to be inconsistent and rationalize. They are able to do things which are not respectable in many ways, intellectually. They can be arbitrary. They can believe one thing and convince themselves of another and profess that they don't know anything about it. They can be sitting on the volleyball, you know, with it underwater, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and say, I don't know anything about God. It isn't clear. They are able to rationalize what they know in their heart of hearts. In fact, the unbeliever must do that, right? Because the goal of all unbelief is like that of Adam and Eve in the garden, to somehow escape the voice of God, to go hide in the bushes. And so in a sense, what you want to do when you defend the faith is show unbelievers how they're hiding in the bushes, how they're sitting on the volleyball and pretending they know nothing about volleyballs, how they are using the Christian worldview without acknowledging it. How they know God, but they refuse to give thanks and to glorify Him as God. 
you want to show that they are deceiving themselves. Now, do you think when you tell this to an unbeliever, when you, when you say to the unbeliever, the reason why you think child abuse is wrong, and you're right in that, is because you really do know God in your heart of hearts. You can't make sense out of that in, your, in terms of your worldview, and yet you know it makes sense. You know that it makes sense because you know God too. You know that what I'm telling you is correct about God the Creator, God the one who sovereignly controls all things. God who sent his son into this world. You know these things are true, and in terms of them, what you say about beauty, or what you say about immorality, or what you say about science makes sense. You know this God in your heart of hearts, and you wouldn't be able to make sense out of your life at all without knowing him or her. Now, when you say that, is the unbeliever going to say, oh, that's right, that's true. <laughs> you got me. Well, sometimes, interestingly, that does happen. I've only seen it once in my experience where it was just that easy. It happens sometimes. They'll say, yeah, I, I was afraid that it was going to come out. I, I, I have to admit it. I've just been trying to run away from the truth. Now, obviously, the work of God there, the Holy Spirit of God, is quite advanced. I mean, they're right on the verge of knowing they have to confess their sins and submit to the gospel by the time you get someone saying that. But in most encounters, when you suggest to somebody, after you've gone through the discussion of answering the fool, not according to his foolishness, but then answering the fool according to his foolishness, you go through all that, and they say, wait a minute, I can't really be a fool. I know how to balance my checkbook. I can't really be a fool. I know how to live in this world. I can't be a fool, because I know certain things are right or wrong. You tell me I can't know those things, but I do know those things. And then you're going to say, well, what I mean is you can't know them in terms of what you say about reality, knowledge, and ethics. But I do know that you know them because the Bible tells me you know God in your heart of hearts. And that's why you're living this way and saying this and feeling this. Basically, the Bible says you're suppressing the truth. You're deceiving yourself. And at that point, the unbeliever's most natural inclination will be to deceive himself about his own self-deception. That is to say, self-deception becomes self-covering. Because if you're going to effectively deceive yourself, then you're not going to be able to admit that you're doing it, or else you'll catch yourself in the deception, and you won't end up being fooled. And you need to know that about the unbeliever. That should make you all the more vigilant in prayer. Because you know that you're bringing a message which, if the Holy Spirit does not bless if the Holy Spirit does not soften the heart and take away the rebellion, the intellectual rebellion of the person you're talking to, that person in one sense is just going to have to harden up all the more and deceive himself or herself all the more. The Bible tells us that the gospel is a savor of life unto life and death unto death. Your job is not to change the heart of the unbeliever. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Your job is to shut his or her mouth. And when you effectively defend the faith, even though the person may go on jabbering and talking, you will, in theory, have shut their mouth when you've shown that their argument can't even make sense apart from the Christian worldview. And that is either going to make them stop and think how they owe God the glory and they must submit to him and the truth of his word, even if they won't tell you that's what they're thinking about. You never know what they think about when they go home and lie down to go to sleep at night. They may say, yeah, though I was very arrogant and told this person I didn't believe that, I really don't know how to answer that, and what am I going to do about it? You don't know how God may be working on that person. But it may be that your witness is going to be used by God as a savor of death unto death, so that the unbeliever becomes more consistent in his or her unbelief, and therefore more ineffective in this world. Again, it's not your job to determine the outcome the spiritual outcome of your witness. It is your job to be faithful in what you say. Your goal is to silence the fool and you leave it to God to determine how the heart will be changed or hardened all the more.